to turn off your video. Here we go. I have to consent. Let's all consent. Continue. Yes, we're all consenting to be recorded. That's the best part about the new Zoom feature, isn't it? All right. So we're going to remind everybody to mute. Turn off your video if you're you're not going to be on. Um, so no questions are going to be fielded from the chat. Those uh, questions have already been predetermined, and uh, we're super excited for that. But you know, I really encourage you to send in some of your feedback of, hey, maybe this would be a question I would have liked to have seen, and then that that maybe can help our next uh, host when they do this. Obviously, we're being recorded, and you had to um, confirm in order to be uh, recorded. So. Thank you for that, but this will be posted on YouTube later as well. So if you hear something you really like and you want to show everybody, please remember it's going to be available for everyone. So for folks who may not know me, my name is Michelle Robinson. Um, I was a previous candidate for uh, Ward 10, and I'm super excited to be here. Oki nagana go meko che che tokom aki. I think it's really important to speak Blackfoot on Blackfoot territory. Uh, so I want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, this land acknowledgement is important, I think, uh, more critical than ever before. Uh, I think a lot of folks were a bit shaken by the news of 215 graves that were found. Why is this relevant? Because our, um, our children are actually in graves and unmarked graves all across the country. There's a whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, volume four, dedicated to this conversation. I have a book club that you can see at 12csi.ca. Uh, you can also go on the Calgary Public Library to sign up so that we can discuss these issues. Uh, but let's start with the land acknowledgement. So um, this land that we're on is uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot Confederacy was actually split up by the US Canadian border. So south of the border are the Blackfeet, north of the border are the Siksika, Ganai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. In 1877, Treaty 7 was signed, and that brought the Dene from Sutina and the Wesley Chiniki Bearspaw Nations from the Stony Nakoda into treaty with the Crown. So I always acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. And for non-Indigenous, the Crown signed on your behalf, making you a treaty partner as well. And if you're unsure of this, I can actually teach you about land acknowledgements and all sorts of fun stuff at nativecalgarian.com, uh, where I'm obnoxiously on podcasts as well as uh, all social media platforms as well. So I'd love to uh, help any future candidates or folks who, in the audience that are unsure of why these land acknowledgements are so critical. So just to explain a bit about this evening, um, I had the pleasure of actually watching other people host. So I should be even more well-versed than the rest of them. But the truth is, uh, Courtney has put together a fabulous uh, format of how everything is going to be working here. So um, each candidate has provided a question ahead of time to ask all of the other candidates to answer. Um, each candidate will respond to each question, including their own, in a predetermined order, which we have already determined. Um, basically, everyone has about, you know, 90, well, 90 seconds to two minutes to kind of answer each question. Um, there'd be a time limit if somebody's rambling, because as we all know, people like myself can go on and on and on with lots of uh, elaborate stories as opposed to just sticking to the topic. Um, in between the candidate questions, I will kind of ask some rapid fire questions of getting to know folks and getting to know uh, what they're interested in in Calgary. And uh, they're gonna hold up their answers on a piece of paper and I will read out their answers, but we will actually let Jacob speak first because that, that's just gonna be way more fun, I think that way. Um, and then once we're kind of going through a bit of our format of questions, rapid fire, we're going to go into some breakout rooms at the end of the session so that folks can talk to the candidate that they want to and maybe ask uh, more clarifying questions or go some, do something like that to that um, extent. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. I hope you're all excited for today. I know I most certainly am. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing each of the candidates with a bio, which has already been supplied to me. Thank you very much, Courtney, and to all of the candidates for doing that work. I greatly appreciate it. So uh, Jacob McGregor is from Ward 1. 
He is a 27-year-old accessibility advocate with experience having served on the city's advisory committee for accessibility and the Calgary Transit Access Eligibility Appeals Board. My upbringing and my time volunteering with the Conservative MP Pat Kelly have instilled the importance of getting the most out of your money, a strong work ethic, but also the importance of listening and finding practical solutions to issues. I want to lead by example, make sure Calgarians are getting the most for their tax dollars and upgrade the aging infrastructure and community meeting places in the established communities of Ward 1. So I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Jacob, for joining us. Next, we have Jennifer. And Jennifer is actually joining us from Ward 2. So she ran in uh, the same civic election I did in 2017, placing second. And she is always uh, looking for ways to reach out and help others. She has extensive experience working in nonprofit, public health and safety, and in public organizations. Having worked in public services, she has seen first-hand areas of improvement and efficiencies and ways to provide taxpayers better services at lower cost. Jennifer looks forward to working collaboratively with the community to amplify concerned voices in Ward 2 and in Calgary. So next we have Erin. And Erin wants to bring her combined business, nonprofit, and governance experience to the councillor role. Now is a critical time for Calgary to move forward, diversify, and be the city that our young people choose to make a home. Erin has lived in Ward 7 for 30 years and for the past 10 years has been an advocate and worked at multi levels of government to address the barriers and inequities in our system. There's work to do to ensure our city is a great place for everyone and Erin is ready to take on for the city she loves. I love that write up. <laughs> Leslin. Leslin is in Ward 10. Whoop, whoop. That's my favorite ward because that's where I live and that's where I ran. So Leslin Joseph was born and raised in Alberta, living in Northeast Calgary for 30 years and in Ward 10 for 22 years. She believes Ward 10 is one of the most culturally diverse neighborhoods in Calgary and it serve, deserves to be celebrated, not ignored or avoided. As a black woman, millennial, local small business owner and activist, Leslin feels that she has what it takes to bring a strong and inclusive voice to council. And then uh, Courtney, really happy she's running in Ward 11. She is a well-known face in the community leadership, has been a catalyst for change in the community or in the neighborhood level, in the tech sector and in city planning. She is enthusiastic about innovation and actively encourages others to participate in creating their best version of the city. And then last but certainly not least is Evan Spencer. Evan Spencer is an experienced community advocate and a great neighbor. He is, a passionate, he is passionately committed to the work that helps residents and businesses in Ward 12 communities thrive. Few things motivate him more than helping people see the power and potential of their neighbors and neighborhoods. So with that, that is our long list of candidates that are just amazing people. And I'm, we're really grateful to be having running for us. Um, if you look in our comment section, you will see that there's links to each and every one of the folks that are running, which is uh, really accessible for a lot of folks. But of course, afterwards, when we're done, all of our questions will have an, an opportunity to talk to people in breakout rooms. So, you know, stick, stick with us, stay tuned, and we'll keep going here. So the first question we have is a Jacob's question. And the people in order to respond is going to be Aaron, Courtney, Jennifer, Evan, Leslin, and then Jacob. So Jacob's question is, how do you view your role as a city councillor? Do you see yourself more as a representative of your ward or as the city as a whole? And Erin, I invite you to unmute and give that a crack in about 90 seconds to two minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Thank you for hosting. Awesome job introducing us all. Uh, I love this question because this role is very much at the two levels of as a councillor, we're representing our individual ward and the citizens that live in the communities within our ward. And so it's listening to individuals and the people who know best what, uh, what needs to be done within communities. 
But I think what often gets lost is that at the city council meetings, the role represents the city and decisions while reflecting the interests of Ward 7, the perspective is what's best for Calgary and what's in the interest of the greater good. And to me, we don't hear enough about the greater good in our political discussions. Uh, to me, these are decisions for the whole of society and not serving any one specific group or, or individuals. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, Courtney, I invite you to unmute and give that question a go. Uh, again, do you see yourself more as a representative of your ward or as the city as a whole? Thanks, Michelle. Um, thanks, Jacob, for the question today. So I just want to, so my answer would be, it's a bit of both, similar to what Aaron said. I think for me, the most important part is that um, I can learn from other counselors across the city what is working in their neighborhoods and what is working in their communities and how do I bring those back to Ward 11? How do I you know, share those resources with them so that we are creating, you know, that greater good for the city. And likewise, I want to take the successes out of Ward 11 and share those learnings back into the city. And there are going to be decisions that we make that are that are big city, big picture thinking. And, and we do need to, you know, dig into, um, you know, what, you know, what our ward needs. But we then also have a, you know, a due diligence to look at you know, what are the other needs in other parts of the city as well, because we, we do make decisions that affect the whole of the city. Oh, that's a great answer. Thanks, Courtney. Jennifer, I invite you to unmute and let us know what you think. Hi, thank you for the question. Like everyone, I think we all see ourselves as a, a dual representative. For me, I see myself going in as a representative of Ward 2. Um, I have to rebuild the trust that has been broken with this position in Ward 2, as well as it's been broken within all of Calgary and, and in some senses all of Canada for what has happened with our current representative. So I have big shoes to fill if, if elected. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good answer. Um, Evan, I invite you to unmute. Thanks for the question. Uh, definitely see myself as needing to be somebody that listens and is a conduit of the voices of the people of Ward 12. So making sure I'm getting out and into the community, uh, learning what the lived experiences of my neighbors, the local businesses, and, and everyone that makes that place a home. And then obviously bringing that back and synthesizing it with the larger picture of Calgary. So um, I really resonate with what has already been said in terms of making sure that becomes part of a cohesive whole and uh, not, uh, not some tribal competition. Mm. Yeah, no kidding. We don't need more of that. Leslin, I invite you to unmute and let us know what you think. Hi. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, listening to everyone else's answers, I, I honestly feel exactly the same way. Um, a counselor should be representative of their wards because we all do have different needs. Um, but as Calgarians, we should look to each ward and think citywide, like what can we be doing best for everyone? Uh, given the current climate, like Calgarians are feeling a little left behind, I feel. And like issues like spending and finances and stuff are really important, but like we're definitely more than that. So I know Ward 10 feels a little left out and I really would like to bring Ward 10 up to where other wards are right now. Brilliant. Love it. Thank you so much, Leslin. Jacob, I invite you to unmute. Um, so if any of you have either seen me at your doors, listen to my podcast, or maybe this is the first time you're going to hear it, but I have always said I view this as a big job interview you guys in ward one are the ones hiring your representative ultimately i have to listen to the people that hired me with that said of course obviously we're a city of a million people i gotta work with the other people that are talking um tonight because we do need to solve issues for the whole city as well Agreed.
well, that was easy. You guys, uh, each person was definitely under their time because I'm timing it. And I thought, worst case scenario, I'll just bring up my phone and remind people. But I didn't even have to do that. You didn't even get to like a minute. So great job to all of you. Thank you for these questions, Jacob, and for the answers from all of our candidates. I really appreciate it. Um, Jennifer's question is actually next. And she asks, what is one of the attributes of the incumbent counselor in your ward that you admire the most. And uh, in order, we're going to do Evan, Leslin, Courtney, Aaron, Jacob, and then lastly, Jennifer, who asked the question. So Evan, I invite you to unmute. And um, as you can see, Courtney's been putting the question right in the uh, chat for a lot of these. So that's been really helpful. So uh, I'll just ask you real quick, um, what are the attributes of the incumbent counselor in your ward that you admire the most, Evan? Uh, for Councillor Keating, uh, what has stuck out the most for me is his commitment to keeping an open mind when he's approaching an issue. So I've watched him hum and haw uh, over a variety of them. And I know that good feedback, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not above good feedback and new data. He, uh, he submits himself to uh, the voices of his ward and then also um, what is coming at him from administration and, and his colleagues. So. Um, I, I believe that's one of those things that I would certainly seek to emulate if I was done the honor of representing Ward 12. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that. I even forgot to hit the start button to double check. Leslin, I, I invite you to unmute your uh, mic and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, well, for me, I don't actually have an incumbent. Uh, Ray Jones stepped down, I think it was last year or um, so for me, I never met him. He was our counselor for many, many years, decades actually. Um, so I'll just say what I admire for any counselor really. It's someone that engages with their constituents and is compassionate and empathetic because I think that's exactly what we need right now. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that. Um, Courtney, since uh, you're up next, I promise I'm gonna I'm gonna actually do two rapid fire questions at the end of this one to make up for missing um, one of my rapid fire questions I was gonna ask last round. But in the meantime, uh, before we get too off topic here, let's go back. What did you like about the uh, incumbent counselor? What what attributes did you admire the most? Thanks, Michelle. You're um, welcome. Thanks, and and thanks, Jennifer, for the, for the question and. Uh, it was one I struggled with. Um, so for me, the one, the thing I guess that sucks out is, um, so it's, it's currently Councillor Farkas, um, is his willingness to hold space in the, in the public um, to take feedback, you know, from constituents. So he did do town halls monthly uh, and, and he did, you know, transition those to online, which I thought were great. Uh, so for me, that's, you know, that was a promise that he made and it's a promise that he stuck to. Um, and so I, and I do think there is something about holding space, you know, for people. And yes, I think the format could be, you know, digged a little bit and always improved on and innovated on. Um, and I'll also say he is very proud of his family uh, and he's very, you know, and I, I do admire that about him. I do, that he um, has a great love for his family and, and his family heritage. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I was just wondering, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, hiding your video. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, let's move on to Aaron. I invite you to unmute and you have, and I will let you answer the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm, as a um, Ward 7 uh, candidate, Drew Farrell is the incumbent and she's got a uh, it's certainly well known for many, many accomplishments. Uh, for me, what, uh, what I really admire most about her, she's always uh, kept a long-term vision and, and a long-term consequences lens to her decision-making. She's never in her history been caught making a decision that seemed okay in the moment or, or felt the pressure of, of what was being said that day and what was predominant in the news. Uh, instead, she would always think about long-term consequences and long-term opportunities to make the best 
decision for the city. And, and being able to keep a vision while you're in the day-to-day -day is an admirable trait. Oh, what a great answer. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I invite Jacob to unmute yourself and let us know what you think about the most um, admirable attribute of your incumbent counselor. See, I thought this was a really interesting question because ultimately this whole process is semi-adversarial. So you end up thinking about a lot of the things you maybe disagree or don't love about your um, incumbent, especially if you're running against one. If I had to pick something I admire about Councillor Sutherland, though, I will say he does a good job of at least attempting to promote the business interest in Calgary as the head of the business advisory council and things like that. He really does care about the economy, even if we might disagree on the level of his execution of this mandate, but I do admire his commitment. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Jacob, for that answer. And Jennifer, what a great question. I can't wait to hear your answer too. Yeah, that's why I asked this question because it is a very adversarial process we are in. And so I wanted to, I had to guide the hardest counselor to answer this one for Joe Maglioka. And I had to dig deep. Um, and he's someone that everyone always tells me he's a guy that you can go to beer with. And that's something that a lot of the community seemed he's very approachable. He's who you'd want to invite to a barbecue. Um, and so that's what I admire about him. And I'd want to keep that approach of people um, wanting to have me come to an event or talk to me and engage with me. And I think that's one thing I admire about him. Um, who pays for it, even if he says he's picking up the tab is another question. And I would be way more honorable than that. Um, and, I, and that's where I, why I asked that question. Oh, what a great answer. Yeah, no, thank you all for that. It's kind of interesting to hear everybody's perspective of their uh, previous candidate and uh, for me trying not to laugh out loud because, and I should just mute myself and then that way I can actually. So I've, I've already messed up. Can you believe it? I had like one job and I've already messed it up. But so I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna give you two rapid fire questions. So what we're gonna do, everybody has their pens, Everybody has their paper. We're going to show our answers. But once everybody has it done, uh, we're going to have Jacob go first and just tell us his answer. So are we all ready? We got our pens ready. I wanted to ask you all, how did you celebrate the stampede during the pandemic? How did you? I can copy and paste this right in there. I can do that while you're all busy writing an answer. And anyone in the audience, feel free. Oh, look at we have answers coming up already. How did you celebrate Stampede during the pandemic? And Jacob, if you want to just yell out your answer, you're welcome to. So this previous Stampede, I was actually six. So I didn't get a chance to, but I look forward to the next, this one coming up if we get a chance. <laughs> this one we might. Evan has a backyard brunch and Aaron said wore my cowboy boots. Leslin said I don't and that I get that. Uh, worn boots from Jennifer and made pancakes at home from Courtney. So that was how everybody celebrated Stampede during the pandemic and I don't think I did a thing which is probably not the reason why I should have asked that question so that you would all know that but <laughs> okay this one is actually more indigenous focused and I knew I would have a little bit of liberty to ask you all this because uh, to me I thought it was important so I'm just going to type it in here and our audience you're welcome to answer this question too do you have a land acknowledgement in your email or website and Jacob you're welcome to unmute yourself and tell us your answer uh, currently, I don't. I think that's something I need to examine, and especially in light of recent events, I think I've always thought it's important. I'm not one of those people that detracts from it, but currently I don't have one. 
Okay, and Jacob, I'm here for you. So what do we have? Evan says website. Courtney says, yes, website. And uh, Jennifer says, not yet. Leslin says, I do. And Aaron says, yes. So we got everybody here. So thank you, everybody. And I'm not seeing audience participation. You know, folks, I don't bite. What I can do, though, is help guide that I can do. So that was that was two. That was two of our rapid um, fire questions. And so we're going to go back to our regular scheduled format now. And you know what? We're actually four minutes ahead of schedule, which is fabulous, which means I'm actually not rambling enough. And here I was concerned I would ramble far too much. So, but this is this is great. Let's get back to this. So Aaron is actually um, up next. Do, do, do. All right, and I have this question. What will be the difference for our city with you as part of city council? And because that's the question, she goes and she answers the last actually. So Leslin, Jacob, Evan, Courtney, Jennifer, then Aaron. So Leslin, I invite you to unmute and answer what will be the difference for our city with you as part of our city council? Uh, well, first off, if I did get elected and I got a seat on council, council will look just a little bit different, obviously. <laughs> um, I think I'm forward thinking. Uh, so that's one thing I would bring. Uh, inclusivity, so making sure the right people are at the table, and openness to change. I'm not really afraid of change, even though my horoscope sign does say I am, and hopefully just a new perspective and voice for the ward. That's awesome. I'm a Capricorn, so immediately I would be like, I'd have to re-emphasize. I am actually a team player, even though my the sign says the opposite. So thank you for that great answer. Um, Jacob, I invite you to unmute yourself and, and answer our question. What would be the difference for our city with you as part of city council? So I have to piggyback a little bit. Um, when uh, I'm on council, it will look a little bit different. I And we're going to need to work on some accessibility issues around the city if... Um, one of the 15 city councillors has physical mobility issues. But outside of that, I'm very big into working as a cohesive unit. I need eight votes to get anything I want done. So obviously I have to be able to work with people, which is something we're not really seeing right now. And I think what you're going to get from me is honest and open communication. Oh, what a great answer. I would vote for you, but I'm not your ward. Sorry, Jacob. Um, I'm going to ask Evan to unmute and invite you to answer that question as well. Thank you. Uh, I think the thing that I want to highlight that I would bring to council is a, a new role for the neighborhood, or maybe not a new role, but a an amplified role for the neighborhood. When I think of the neighborhood, I see it as kind of the fundamental agent and organizing block for change. It's uh, big enough that when people get on board with something, stuff happens and the city takes notice, um, but small enough that you can be a known character in the story of that place and, um, and your relationships matter and your character matters and all the rest. So it's still small enough to have, have the, the pieces that kind of build um, the relational webs that we all rely on. Um, and small enough for that and big enough to have systemic change, hopefully come right out of it. So I would, I would like to be a part of amplifying the role of the neighborhood in the city. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Courtney, I invite you to unmute. Thanks. Yeah. So for me, I think that the thing that I would like to bring um, is and where that change will come is being rooted in community. And when I think about community, I think about, you know, there's our proximal neighborhoods, but there's other kinds of communities that we're into. We, right, we're part of faith communities, we're part of business communities, um, we're part of, you know, sports and hobbies type communities. 
And for me, when we can be rooted in those different kinds of communities and we are connecting those communities um, and, you know, myself as counsel, hoping to be a conduit between those communities, um, we get back to a little bit on what everyone was touching there about building relationships and having great relationships. And when we have relationships and we have strong networks, we have trust. And when we trust each other, we can actually be more innovative. We can be more creative and we can thrive as a city. So for me, you know, making sure that people can root into community is going to be really important. So it's also about helping people identify, you know, where their sense of place is, where their sense of belonging is in our city um, and helping to equip them in those roles, um, in leadership roles and in, in service roles in those in those communities. Um, again, to create that future and that vision for, for Calgary that they really believe in. So for me, that's the big one is I want to, you know, show people that I'm myself rooted in community um, and help others find a way to be to be rooted in community so we have relationships and trust and can move forward quicker and faster. Well, that's great. And look at you, like one minute and 90 seconds or 90 seconds here is what you did. So like, I didn't even have to like show you my my timer that I have here just in case we start rambling too much. Yeah. This question actually has brought out some of the best answers. I just love them. So Jennifer, I invite you to unmute and uh, tell us what your thoughts are about um, this question. For me, this question is a nice one because I am looking to bring a voice for Ward 2 to City Council. Currently, our issues aren't being advocated for. Um, they're not being brought before the journalists to be discussed and to show Calgary what's going on in War II, how we do need transit and our, our needs aren't being met. Our, or I am constantly hearing that our counselors not answering or listening to our community when, when they have issues. I'm also someone that's not afraid to go um, and door knock when there's a hot topic going on in a neighborhood and hear the concerns of the community. I think that's extremely important as a counselor is you can't be afraid of adversity in your community. You have to kind of lean into it, listen and find commonalities of both sides of a polarized issue because really we are all looking to build a community, have safe homes, have safe communities. And um, I'm really looking forward to have the opportunity to really drive that home if elected. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that answer. And Erin, such a great question. So now you get to answer it and I get to reset. All right, I'm ready. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. That was, those were interesting answers. Uh, for me, it's the culmination of my experience, uh, my working life, and then raising three kids in Ward 7 will make the difference. I have the context of Ward 7's history of the, the context of working with CEOs and CFOs in my corporate career, and, and which uh, gave me a good understanding of finance, and the context of nonprofit management, um, which showed me how to get things done with limited resources, and also showed me the barriers in our system and how to work with other levels of government. Uh, finally, I have a solid understanding of board governance because I've sat on nine boards, including being a board chair at DJD when the uh, DJD building was built. It's this mix of experience that I think will allow me to be key to moving our city forward, bringing people along to be part of that change uh, and bridging to other views and contrary positions. We all share passion, uh, but there's no substitute for experience. And it's experience I've often learned the hard way. I, I you know, often thought the passion was the only thing I needed and I've had to learn those other skills. And that's what I'm bringing to city council. And I think, I think that can make a difference. And I hope to join lots of young, passionate people who, who probably don't have the experience, but have, have endless energy and passion and I'll be that experienced voice. Oh, great answer. Well, you know, that brings us to the end of uh, Aaron's question for all of the candidates. And I just really loved hearing basically everyone talk about what they love the most about the city. It really kind of came through in that answer. So I appreciate that. So now it's my turn. Rapid fire, no question in advance. I just thought it up and now you have to figure it out. So if everybody has their pens, and they're, and they're paper ready. I have, I have tough questions for you. So as we all seen, like, you know, 36 is quite normal. 
on a on a Calgary day. And I have my big question. I'm, I'm just going to give you the the setting here in Calgary Force Lawn. We actually have like this outdoor pool. And it's one of my favorite places to go because it's nice and shaded because of all of the beautiful trees that the city already has planted. So my rapid fire question to you is where is your favorite place to cool off on a hot, sunny Calgary day? Mm -hmm. do, I've do, always do. been a fan of just sitting in the shade, either in my backyard or in a 12 mile Cooley Park. Of course, I have to also think of the Tuscany Club up where I live does have a splash park, but I don't have family, so I don't generally have a lot of reason to go there. So it's usually shade either in my backyard or in 12 Mile Coley Park. We have Actually, great parks Jacob, in the city. Now you're talking and I'm like, boy, do we have wheelchair accessible water parks? Just going to keep that in everybody's head as we go. Evan, you have Lake. Lake isn't your answer. Backyard with friends is Courtney. Jennifer, can you put that up one more time? My backyard, perfect. Princess Island from Leslin and by the bow with Aaron. So that was oh, tough questions around here, holy. But yeah, my answer would have definitely been Forest Lawn Outdoor Pool. And I'm really, really, really hoping maybe this summer we can end up there, that's for certain. So. All right, back to serious questions. Leslyn, actually, uh, it's her question next. And um, her question is, what are some of your main objectives once you get into council? And she is last because that is her question. So we're going to go with Courtney, Jennifer, Aaron, Evan, Jacob, and then Leslyn. So Courtney, I invite you to unmute and answer the question of what are some of your main objectives when you get into council? Not if, when. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to focus on two. Uh, the first one is short and sweet. Coroplast recycling. Hot topic during election season. We don't have coroplast recycling in Calgary. They have it in Edmonton. Um, so that's one. Um, my second one, uh, it's one I've been talking about, is rethinking the community association model. Um, specifically, I want to talk about how community associations are um, managers of their facilities and the challenges in upgrading and maintaining facilities and the burden that falls on volunteers. Uh, I do think that there is work that, um, you know, both the city and the province actually could be doing um, to support our community associations. It is a unique model to Alberta and lots of people move to Calgary and they don't know about it. Uh, so also what is the messaging around our community community associations, um, also resident associations, although it's, you know, there are different models, but um, so how are we also going to get people back connected to their community associations? Um, and one of the reasons I want to lift that burden off community associations is so they can get back to the work of doing their true mandate, um, which is, you know, providing social and recreational opportunities to residents. Uh, so I think there are better ways that we can equip them um, and I think part of that is removing some of the, the burdens and challenges that um, many of them are facing. Um, and it's definitely something I see in 11. Man, the host mutes herself, whole oh, lot. But we were under our 90, 90 seconds there. So that's brilliant, great answer. Thank you for that. Um, so next is Jennifer. I invite you to unmute and answer what are some of your main objectives once you get onto council? My main one is to rebuild trust. I think that seems simple uh, on the surface, but when you really think about um, the harm that's been done, it's gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take a lot of community engagement. It's gonna take a lot of listening, um, creating channels for people to be able to get to the office, to have the conversation uh, with me um, if elected and to trust that they can send an email or knock on the door and have me actually answer because right now they're everyone's sort of become conditioned to not having that opportunity to speak to their elected official so trust is the big one. Oh great answer and only 30 seconds you guys are really good for your time I can't uh, encourage you enough Erin I invite you to unmute yourself. Hi thanks. Well, Ward 7 is lucky enough to have all of downtown in the ward as of uh, the election. So the giant conundrum that is our empty downtown 
uh, it really belongs uh, principally to Ward 7, although it's an entire city issue. Uh, so that that's something I'm really excited to take on, and I call it a conundrum because rather than seeing it as a problem, I just think it's really an interesting thing to have that gorgeous skyline, and then we have to figure out how to really reinvigorate the on the ground and the human experience downtown uh, so that we repopulate it. I think we could have both elementary and high schools downtown and encourage families to live downtown. There's got to be lots of families that would be attracted to having a home where they don't have to cut lawns and love the access to the paths and and enjoy that downtown lifestyle. Empty nesters the same, probably tired of cutting lawns and want to move downtown. So I think there's lots of opportunity to, to revision downtown. Uh, and I think that can be better than it was at our economic peak when we had a busy downtown from noon till one, and then it emptied out at five. And so it never really was vibrant, even when all those buildings were full. So there's there's a different picture we can paint there and work towards that actually will be something even better to serve the citizens of Calgary. Part of what I see as the solution, while we've already had funding approved for the Glembo and Arts Commons, rather than those major capital projects, I want to see small connector projects that animate alley spaces and more west downtown instead of where those major projects are. So that if you're riding along the path and in front of Eau Claire, you actually have a really nice connection into the core uh, on your bike or walking. Right now, that doesn't exist. So I think there's small, cheap and cheerful projects that can really make a difference for the day-to-day -day experience being downtown. And I think the potential with that is going to make downtown even better than it was you know, 20 years ago. So I'm excited to, to hopefully... Uh, uh, leverage other support from other levels of government and get all the awards uh, together to work on that project. Mm. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Look at you under time. Way to go. <laughs> and Evan, I invite you to unmute. Thank you. Uh, I think one for me certainly is going to be jobs and opportunity. Uh, it's an area I have a lot of learning to do in. But when I think of uh, well, the opportunities that are right in front of us, one of them that jumps out uh, that it will be a priority for me is kind of restoring the relationship between the planning and the development community. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the opportunity over this last year working in Councillor Keating's office to see some of those dynamics at play. And, and I would love to sit at a table um, with representatives from both communities and, and work through that. Uh, I think uh, there's a bit of an adversarial relationship dynamic um, between the two. And I, I like to think that I'm good at bringing people together and um, finding win-win solutions and uh, breaking down those barriers as relationships build around a table. And, and it certainly seems like there's lots of will on both sides of that. So that would be a, a big one, more aspirational, lots of learning to do to get to that. Um, but another one would be in the neighborhood. Uh, I just love what happens when people have a real sense of connection and affinity and ownership of their place. Um, I've watched that happen time and time again in my neighborhood in Mahogany. Um, one of the things that I bring to the table is a longtime volunteer for the last, before I even moved into my neighborhood, I got involved and started volunteering. And they kind of rolled out this red carpet to get involved. And so a little bit of money went a really long way in terms of activating people in that neighborhood to make it the best place they've ever lived. Um, some of my most longest standing relationships and some of the coolest things I've gotten to do over the last five years have been directly tied to being in my neighborhood and, and, and getting stuff done together. So I think at a municipal level, I think we can activate people through the, the culture that we build and the resources that we make available uh, so that people have a real sense of ownership with where they live. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Evan. I appreciate that. Uh, Jacob, I invite you to unmute and tell us what you think. So, I'm going to get through as many of these as possible because I have a lot of specific things I'd like to get done. Um, I want to, on day one, I want everybody to know I will be donating 10% of my salary and signing whatever I need to sign to not accept a transition allowance. This has to do with, uh, like Jennifer said, building that trust back up and leading by example. Um, and then there's some 
community level goals I I would really like to see like renovations to the Triwood Arena and some of these older community spaces in and around my ward that people gather at, they spend time at. Uh, they raise their kids there. They recreate in these places. Um, fixing our paths. The, these are things, like Aaron said, that affect people every day and their experience of the neighborhood. Um, my board has consistently told me we need to properly staff our new fire station up here in Tuscany. That hasn't been properly staffed since it was built. And that's just not safe. And what's worse, not a lot of people know that it's not staffed properly. Also, and I don't, I want to emphasize this as much as I can, you are gonna hear from me every week. I'm gonna have a day specifically devoted to constituent and community issues. That line's gonna be open. Right okay. on. Well, I am going to cut you off because that is your two minutes, sir. But great job on that answer and getting as much of that in in one answer. That was fabulous. And Leslin, it was your question. Great question. And I, I invite you to unmute yourself and let us know what your thoughts are. Okay. I, there we go. I, I'm really big on community engagement and like awareness and safety, all to hopefully change the narrative of the Northeast. So there's been a lot of basic needs that Ward 10 needs just to catch up to other wards, like even Ward 5 or Ward 9, which are literally right beside us. So, and th there are basic things like just awareness to programs and services, upgrading the leisure center or community centers, affordable housing developments, um, upgrading the existing ones, Road maintenance is huge over here. And like, I want people to know about 311, 211 and the non-emergency line. And I, what's close to my heart is getting programs for BIPOC members just because like Ward 10, Ward 5 and Ward 9 have like probably the most in the city. And I mean, if you're not being served well enough it is one of those members then you can't really help the rest of the community that's just how i feel at least and another big thing it would be safety through revitalization which is just like maintaining things like having bus shelters and benches and proper lighting and trees cut back just honestly these are basic things that i think we need so that's my thing right on and under the wire too so thank you for that thank you all for your answer it's a great question um leslie and i i obviously didn't want to show you so much favoritism because you're in my ward but i was just screaming inside yes 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 that's what we need for ward 10 so it was really great to hear you say those answers as it was to hear everybody uh tell us a little bit of what they're seeing in their wards that definitely need to uh be number one priority. So now we're back to the uh, pen and paper part of our um, evening where everybody has a piece of paper and a pen and has to put on their thinking cap really quickly and think about, you know, when, when somebody comes here to Calgary, we always go, oh, let's go to Banff. But I am here asking you as counselors, counselor candidates, what? When was the last time you went up the Calgary Tower? When was the last time you went up the Calgary Tower? And if you have a fun story, that's even better. Tower would have been a good four or five years ago. My family used to billet hockey players for the Max Midget Tournament every Christmas when it came to town. And we'd always take those because uh, they were European players and they 
would always want to go up the tower, things like that. But it's been a few years now. Amazing. Thank you. I have a salt and pepper shaker two and a half years ago. That's pretty specific, Courtney. <laughs> Never a fan of heights. Jennifer says, I, I get that. Aaron, did I see 10 years ago? 10 years ago and four years ago for Evan and a little closer, Leslin. I was outside it just a few weeks ago. Yes, yes. Good answers. Great answers. What was your favorite color on there? I'm just kidding. That's another question for another day. But at least I got my rapid fire question in. So I, I want to know when was the last time, you know, a candidate has been a, around the tower because, you know, it's our thing. And my um, husband and daughter make fun of me regularly and call it our itty bitty tower because, you know, they've been spoiled enough to go to the CN Tower more than once. So anyway. <laughs> Back to Courtney has a question for everyone. So um, this is going to go uh, Jacob, Jennifer, Leslin, Evan, Aaron, and Courtney. And Courtney's question is, if you had to come up with a new slogan for Calgary, what would it be? And how did you come up with it? Because please note that our current slogan is, be part of the energy. <laughs> oh, that was melodramatic, right? Jacob, you are welcome to unmute yourself and tell us what you think our new slogan for Calgary should be. Well, I'll start by saying I was always a fan of the heart of the new West slogan that we got rid of a few years ago. But if I was to create one of my own, it would be the driving Canada forward. And this would be both economically and socially. That's a great answer. I love it. Oh, I better start resetting my timer here. Jennifer, you are welcome to unmute yourself. I came up with Calgary where the sky is unlimiting because we have spectacular skies. Um, it can sell this to the world because it also creates a visual for when we're trying to market Calgary outside of Alberta, it sells us across Canada, it sells us in San Francisco, and it also lets us know that, or the people that want to come here, that we're going to try not to put barriers in front of you for having a business operate. Um, we're going to have options for if you want to have a family here, you can live downtown, you can live in the suburbs, you can actually afford to have a, suburb, a suburban house here if you want. So I think there's a lot of unlimiting opportunities within Calgary that needs to be marketed and hence why Calgary where the sky is unlimiting. I love it. I love it. That sounds wonderful. Leslin, I uh, invite you to unmute. Uh, I had a hard time with this one at first, which is bad because I'm really good at slogans. Um, so I feel like we're more than the energy sector and we need to work towards diversifying our economy. Calgary also is one of the most diverse cities in Canada, so that should be celebrated. And like visually, the city is super diverse. We have like a bunch of different like ecosystems here. So I went with diversity lives here. I love it. I think that's a great, uh, you know, part of what I was running about on Ward 10 as well. But I think it's been amplified so much with so much going on right now. Um, so we just uncovered the 215 graves. Uh, there was just an attack in uh, London for uh, against the Muslim community, and it, it's just an awful tragedy. Of course, George Floyd. So there were so many reasons to start talking about diversity, and I was really happy to hear you bring that up. So thank you for that. Um, Evan, I think it is your turn to unmute, and I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on a new slogan. Um, I also like the heart of the New West. I maybe because it's just comfortable. I don't. I don't know. Uh, but then, so when I started working at it, I thought yeah, I got to do a little bit of an homage to the cowboy theme. I don't know why. I just felt like I had to. So I came up with spurring us on because I, I wanted. I wanted something where you know the Spurs. You know, so you had that, and then I knew I wanted something together. And then I also feel like this. You know, Calgary gives you a sense of what's possible. You have these majestic mountains um, beside us and 
And it really is an inspiring place to live in lots of different places. And it increasingly is becoming so year after year as more of the diversity that was spoken of in the arts and culture and, and all these things that are starting to flourish in Calgary. So spurring us on, that's my, that's my submission. Love it, love that. Spurring on Aaron. Aaron, would you like to unmute and tell us about your idea for a slogan? Yeah, I, uh, I did my whole, my first career was a communications consultant. So I, my answer is gonna sound like how con consultants talk, which is to, uh, put off a specific answer, but um, in what I do believe is a, a slogan needs to be, you need to um, uh, engage professional writers and, and maybe even a poet to come up with, a, to craft the actual slogan. But for me, the opportunity comes from what will inspire it. And I'd love to have a slogan that's influenced by where our city uh, is going and where it will be in 10, 20, 30 years. And, and invite uh, our young people to, to help articulate what that is and should be. And in my mind, a good slogan, it's credible. You believe that it ac accurately reflects Calgary, but it's aspirational and it really helps inspire to where the city's going. So my ideal slogan has, has some credibility for where we are today, but really paints that picture for all of us of where we're going. Oh, I love it. So I was muted and I was afraid I was going to not unmute myself in time. So Courtney, I'm going to pass the reins over to you and spur your answer. Thanks. Um, I just put a little thing in the chat about some slogans about Calgary's history um, and also actually how ineffective they are. So um, I just want to thank everyone for having super fun with it. So um, I, first, I want to tell you the one that first came to my head, which I would definitely not use, but it's Ooh Hey, the New West Way. So like Yahoo backwards. So Evan, also thank you for playing on. Um, <laughs> thank you, Michelle. I could see you laughing. Um, but what I get, what I actually settled on it, and because again, like it would need so much more work. It's just like home of the home of the unstoppables. I I feel like we are right. We you know it's like you know we. We, we face adversity and we face challenge, but we are constantly rising. And, and yeah, a lot, like, yes, lots of cities have that. Um, but I do, I feel like there is always this push and this drive forward in our city. Um, and I am happy to be a part of it um, and be alongside others who, who want to be moving us forward as well. So, um, but you know, ooh, hey, the new West way, uh, for sure, close second, for sure. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Yeah, no, and now I'm going to have to uh, find out more about that. That was something I was going to Google just to kind of, you know, try to talk about other stuff. But then we had our rapid fire question. And as you all know, I have a book club. So not too many people can say that they are nerds and love to read books, but I love reading it. And I know I'm with my people because you probably all love policy. So with that, I'm just going to assume you all utilize your libraries. And with that question, I'm going to ask, and I encourage audience participation, which library do you use? What is your favorite library? I'd love to hear about your library experiences because I run my book club out of Calgary Forest Lawn. Actually, during the pandemic, we took a break, but I learned how to utilize Zoom, but now we're back with the library. So, you know, our book club is from seven until, or is it, no, it's 6.30 till eight now, every second Monday, learn about Indigenous issues, talk about that. Jacob, do you want to unmute and tell me which library do you use? I'm a big audiobook guy, so I'm going to be honest and say the biggest library I use is the Apple Audiobook Store, but for Perfect. the local... For the local libraries, um, I generally tend to go to the one at the Crowfoot Y or um, the what used to be Cardell Place, Vivo, for because those are the closest ones to me. Awesome, good answer. New Central or Southwood, Courtney says. Crowfoot, Jennifer says. Uh, Kindle Seaton, Evan says, Village Square for a movie, says Leslin, and Louise Riley, Erin. Oh, I love that area. I've always wanted to go in that one. There's um, 
I've never been in that one. So that is definitely one I want to go to. So we're going to move on now to Evan Spencer's question of if you received a million dollar grant for your ward, what would you do with it and why? And order of answer is Jennifer, Aaron, Jacob, Leslin, Courtney. And then of course, because it's Evan's question, he gets to answer it last. So I invite Jennifer to unmute and answer the question. If you received a million dollar grant for your ward, what would you do with it and why? First things first, I try and leverage it for some more funds. Um, I try and partner with the Fed, federal government, the provincial government, community groups, nonprofits. Um, and my goal would be to build a community clubhouse multi-sport um, building over at Inland Athletic Park. It's a highly used field. Um, we have a cricket pitch there as well. And I find that without having a building that has shower facilities, these sports clubs don't have anywhere to store their equipment except um, like sea cans. And so, and we're also moving, I noticed there's um, a ski, ski hill now put in there since they closed it at um, the, uh, anyway, they closed the other one down. And so we need to have a building there so you can store first aid equipment, you can have showers, you can have a, when thunderstorms pass overhead, we can have a safe cover area for kids to go in and stay safe. Um, and I think we also need more community buildings within War II. We're having lots of new builds go in, but we're not having community buildings go in. So that's what I would like to leverage. Awesome. Well, thank you. And under a minute. Holy. Well, you're all really good at staying on time, I tell you. Um, Aaron, I encourage you to unmute yourself and let us know what you think. Yeah, this was fun to figure out as someone who's run a nonprofit. Um, you're always, you know, very have skinny budgets, but you always spend time thinking about if you did have that larger gift, how you'd use it to make sure you're ready and, and can use it thoughtfully. So this was the same kind of exercise and I enjoy it, enjoyed it. Um, you know, if that money came right now to Ward 7, um, I'd be thinking about recovery from the pandemic because my theory is that we'll need very precise, very targeted recovery uh, actions because not everybody felt the impacts equally, even within groups and within business sectors. It was very specific who, who, took, who, who bore the brunt of that. Um, so a million dollars at the community level has the opportunity to be informed uh, on the ground by citizens who know very specifically what the issues are and what the neighborhoods need. Um, and, and another option is that money could be used immediately for known needs as part of recovery, or it could be an endowment contributing 100,000 each year to the ward and sustain a longer term service or project, which is really important because sometimes that one-time funding uh, builds a project and then there's no way to maintain or sustain it. So that's another option. Um, but how I'd start that is by having community input on the general goal for what the investment should be achieving and what everyone, uh, you know, the consensus on what, how to use it, whether that's a recreation project, safety, some other focus, and then gather those project suggestions and uh, do some planning on it and then and then get the community to, to decide the best use of that, likely working with community associations to help leverage that input and, and uh, make those decisions. But um, so again, just a planning process of defining a goal and making sure that uh, the most people possible would benefit from, from those funds. Thank you so much, Aaron. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to invite Jacob to unmute himself and tell me if you had a million dollars, if you had a million dollars. You know, it's, it's funny you reference that song because a million dollars used to go a lot farther than it would now. So I have to start off by saying, yeah, you got to probably try and get more money out of your provincial and federal partners. But if you couldn't do it and only had a million dollars to go on, um, you would, I'd probably be putting it towards these smaller community projects. Lots of our community associations want to start like community gardens. We have pathways we need to fix, especially in bonus pathways and sidewalks and things like this are falling apart. Um, 
if we had a little bit of money for a specific project to help fix Triwood or partnering with my friends in Ward 2 to maybe get some of some work done in on COP and fix up our aging facilities there. These are things that people in the Northwest use and love and need. So these are projects I'd be working on for sure. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you so much for that answer, Jacob. Leslin, do you have any Dijon playgrounds that we need to answer? Yes. Um, so small businesses are pretty much like the heart and soul of Calgary. And in War 10, we have a large percentage of newcomers that own small businesses. So the Northeast is actually the only quadrant that doesn't have a business improvement area. So I would like to use a million dollars if I got it to set that up. Um, alternatively, I would also consider using it to uh, repurpose Marlboro Mall. There's portions of it that are just sitting unused and maybe turn it into some sort of trades area because there used to be like a cow tire there so you could do automotives um, and it was Sears so the space is pretty open and you can just change that into working spaces. So that's my idea. Well, that sounds awesome. I love these ideas. Courtney, I invite you to unmute. Uh, tree fort in the yard. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but honestly, so I'm going to borrow from Aaron's language, cheap and cheerful. Um, I actually kind of like that kind of ties into what I want to do. So um, if I had a million dollars, um, what I would like to do is um, actually create some te like some dedicated spaces that are targeted towards teenagers, um, but also senior citizens. So, so making sure there's a multi-generational standpoint. Um, and what I, what I imagine this being is um, seating, shade, lighting, especially in the evenings, right? I mean, it gets dark at 4.30 on, you know, <laughs> during the, you know, during the winter, but doesn't mean it's cold out. We get Chinooks. Um, so, and I know we've got all had a lot of these little parklets and container parks and things pop up, but they tend to, you know, they tend to happen in our busy core areas we need those in communities we need them proximal to transit we need spaces for our teens um, and our tweens to be able to hang out safely um, and when I and elevated spaces actually are are things that teens crave I have a I have a tween who loves nothing more than climbing a tree and reading a book um, that's her go-to because she feels like she's part of something but kind of observing right um, we need spaces for teens who aren't necessarily sports focused teens, right? So art parks, you know, places to express creativity in public. So for me, that's what I imagine bringing to Ward 11, um, you know, across some different sites that cheap and cheerful, interactive. And the last thing I'd want to add to that, yeah, 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 time, um, is, <laughs> is that, um, you know, partnering um, with some learning agencies. Um, so some like momentum comes to mind. Um, around helping um, equip teenagers with that first business opportunity. So do they do, do they do mini markets? Do they have a canteen? Are there ways to, you know, empower teens in that area? Can they walk dogs? And that's their meeting point. So that's what I would love to see. That's what I would do with a million dollars. Oh, I love it. Love it. Um, Evan, I invite you to unmute yourself and let us know what you think. It's a great question. It was super fun listening to it, all the answers. Uh, for me, I... I would love to do some sort of participatory uh, budgeting, granting within the neighborhood with probably using, utilizing the community associations and, and taking kind of a issues opportunities approach where um, you do some engagement and get people to say like, what are, what are the areas that every time you, go, you walk through it or you drive through it, you're scared? Um, what are, you know, ask some, some specific questions about how people live in, in Ward 12 and then, uh, invite uh, folks that may have a solution to, to pitch it at a pitch night. And I just think this happens across Calgary. 
Um, I know we have like Platform Calgary and some of these different organizations do this to catalyze great startups and all. I would love to see this used more often potentially. Like I know Federation of Calgary Communities has their, their Activate YYC grants that do, you know, catalyze all kinds of cool things. But I just think of in terms of having a sense of togetherness and, and you know, how cool would it be for a whole ward to get together and to start to solve some of their own issues instead of, you know, I think one of the, one of the tracks that we're on is the city kind of solves our issues where I would love to see the city working more specifically with people in neighborhoods and finding new ways to be creative. And I just know it's a lot of work. So how cool would it be if like people really got a sense of excitement about like, we're all gonna work together to solve that lighting issue, this traffic issue and uh, activate spaces and do all these other things. So th that, that would be specifically if I, and if I was gonna choose, um, I think it would be a market. Uh, Southeast Calgary doesn't have a great market and I would wanna do it up pretty great, great with some great lights and along the promenade in mahogany and people would drive from all over the city to come hang out and it would activate people in homes that are um, displaced and you know maybe make great cinnamon buns and could uh, connect with a, a market or with uh, people that would want their cinnamon buns. I'm done. Amazing. No, that's good. I probably started it sooner anyway, so that's perfect. Love hearing everybody's answers. That was such a fun one for me too. So I, I just wanted to thank you all. Um, so every single ward, this is very ward specific, very. So we're putting on our ward only specific ads. And I'm going to ask you, every single ward has like a signature restaurant that if I say, oh, if you're in my area, you're going to Atlas Pizza, you know, if you're in Ward 9, Burns Pizza is there. I want to ask you, what is your, um, one of your favorite restaurants that most people don't know in your ward that you, uh, that is your kind of like secret place? I better type that one. I was going to say your favorite restaurant, but I want a really specific one that probably we haven't heard of, your favorites. Well, up in up in Tuscany where I live, our local um uh drinking establishment, shall we call it, has really good food too. It's called the Last Straw. Ooh, love it. Last straw from Jacob. We have uh is is it Roadie Hut? Is that how you say it, Leslin? You're muted. Roti Hut. Roti Hut. Okay, thank you. Koto Aaron says, I hope I got that right. Bohong uh, Vietnamese in Ranchland. Empire Provisions in Courtney, from Courtney, sorry. And then Green, how would I say that, Evan? Chili? Oh, green chili. Okay, that sounds good. Oh, and people are putting it right in there. Holly, thank you for that answer from Ward 4. Oh, now I want to go. That sounds great. Awesome. Okay, good answers. Now, oh, I also wanted to acknowledge that it's Pride, Pride Month. Um, so you'll see that I put she and her pronouns right in my um, host there to try to be encouraging of, you know, those who may identify as trans to use they and them just in case. And we want to also acknowledge that it's Indigenous Month. Uh, so June 21st is our big day and Calgary Aboriginal Awareness Week has a website and you can, you know, come have a look at some of our events. It's for all of Calgary to come and join us. And I always want to acknowledge World Refugee Day, a really important day as well for a lot of our folks, especially here in the Northeast. So with that, we're going to move on to the breakup rooms. So I want uh, to have, oh, first I wanna remind everybody of the June 28th event. So if you really liked what you've seen here, I encourage you to come back and do the June 28th event with us. Um, that is already on Eventbrite and we can, we'll put all those names in um, about who's there. But for this breakout room, we're gonna put Jacob in room one, Jennifer in room two, Aaron in three, Leslin four, Evan five, or sorry, Evan six and Courtney five. I don't know what my brain just did there, but I, I also wanna encourage everybody to donate to campaigns. So I hope you heard all of these wonderful candidates and thought I absolutely want to donate to them. And if you just listened and thought they gave a really great answer because they said your favorite restaurant even, give them a dollar, give them 20, get their sign, endorse them even, that would be great. These are things that we wanna do. So. Um, 
when we go into the breakout rooms, you can kind of just ask one on one questions with folks. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay here. So and I'm going to talk to myself, but I'm going to invite people to, uh, you know, uh, we're still recording. So if you put on the video, then of course, we'll see you here in this main one. But in the breakout room, it's all you kind of get to do your own thing. So I, I encourage everybody to go to their breakout room. So we have, oh, we have it in here. Courtney's already put it out, which room each person is going to go to. I want to say thank you all for letting me host. It's been my pleasure. This has been so well thought out, thanks to uh, this initiative that Courtney put together. Each candidate gave such great questions and answers, and it was really my pleasure to listen to everybody. So thank you. And with that, yeah. yeah. I'm actually, so just really quickly, I'm going to stop the recording.